Yes, we're gonna we're gonna get started now. I think we've got uh, quite a quite a lot of people in on the call. So thanks so much for making the time to out of your day, whether it be your morning or afternoon or after work today, just to go through this. I'm going to go through quite a lot of information in a short space of time. Um, I can share the slides with you as well. I'll drop you my email address as we go through this and uh, make that make it clear that you can um, drop me a line and I can send you the the slides as well, and then you can go through them at your own time because it's quite a lot of content to cover. OK, let's get started. So this is the part where I tell you why you should be listening to me, I guess, and then why I've got a, a level of credibility. So I've worked with a lot of uh, big companies in the financial sector as well as um, elsewhere in the super industry here in Australia, as well as some of the retail areas. And now I focus on my own consultancy. So I'm the managing director of uh, the, Mod the Modular Analytics Company. And um, as part of that, I focus on data architectures and building data strategies now for clients. And over the last couple of decades, I've worked across the data analytics industry in a number of different roles. And if you could just, I'm just going to mute everybody, just to make it clear for everybody to hear. So that's basically me. You've read everything else on the screen there. So if you're on menti.com, if you put the code in, you should see the slide and you should be able to select an option on this. It should tell me where you are in the world. Let's just give that a test. There we go. Excellent. So early morning for some of you in, in Europe. End of the day for some of you guys in, in Asia as well. I'll just give everybody a couple of minutes to just see if they can get on that link and vote. And then we'll move on in a couple of slides time. I've got another slide where I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions around this related to what I'm going to go through. OK. OK, America is cool. Welcome. OK, cool. We're getting quite a few responses now, so it looks like it's uh, it's working for everybody. So let's move on quickly. So a bit of introduction, PII and GDPR specifically. So GDPR regulation, if you're not familiar, was published in 2016 and implemented in 2018. And during that time, I was working in the UK as a head of data for FTSE 100 insurer, insurer. So some of you might have been in this place as well when it came into play. We suddenly found ourselves in our position where we had to kind of work out what that legislation meant and understand the impact that that had on our data architecture and our business processes and how we were going to get into a place where we could satisfy that legislation and not be at risk of reputational damage or financial um, fines as well. Now, fast forward to 2021, we're in a position where we're a lot clearer on that legislation as better understood. It's now matured enough that people have different approaches and designs and patterns that make sure that your data architectures and systems are now GDPR compliant. So I would say it's less a function of the data warehouse or even though I'm going to go through some snow, snowflake specific stuff in this um, presentation. I will clearly call it out when I do that. It's more function of the design you adopt. So you can apply this design to any um, data warehouse that you're working on and it doesn't necessarily need to be snowflake specific although I will give you some indication of when I'm going to talk about that, that stuff later. So it's really important that spending some time up front, if you have that luxury in terms of design and stuff, can save a lot of headaches in the future. So one of the major issues that we found when I was working as the head of data with regards to GDPR was the right to erasure, and that's more commonly known as the right to be forgotten. So once an individual or customer requests an organization to delete PII from their database, your organization has a short period of time between usually between 30 to 90 days, depending on the on the actual criteria to remove the personal data from the databases, any copies that you have, and that includes backups. So this raises some specific questions, and these are the ones um, that I'm going to cover off and how you can um, ensure that your design can cater for these requirements. The first one is how do you ensure all PII data is removed from the database? The second one is how do you cleanly remove the PII data without breaking the integrity of your data model? And what I'm talking about there is referential integrity. You don't want to be deleting anything out that has a dependency from another master table and breaking that referential integrity in your database. 
And how do you make this process process as efficient as possible for users to administer? So how do you how do you put these things in place without creating a massive overhead for your teams who are operationally supporting your data and databases? So again, we've got another question now for the guys who are able to log into menti.com. And this one is, what are your biggest challenges when it comes to PII data? And you should see a range of options come up there. Um, I've just limited it to four, but it'd be good just to get a, a general sense of where you guys are from, from this perspective within your own organization. You know, one is, do you have data silos scattered across your organization everywhere? And it's really hard to understand where PII data is. It could be on Excel sheets on someone's computer. It could be hidden in access databases and somewhere else, and it's really difficult to get a get a sense of where that is. Covering the whole threat landscape, and that, that includes different devices and um, end user computing, as well as servers and things in the cloud as well. It's it's quite a broad domain to cover now with the, the advent of the cloud computing arena. And then we've got human error and bring your own devices again, uh, bring your own devices and uh, quite a new concept and, and makes it more challenging for you guys to secure data. So looking at the results there, that's kind of what, what I would expect data everywhere being top of the list. And it was one of our biggest challenges to kind of just work out where actually this PII data lived in our organization before we could look at how to, how to control that and put the right controls around it. So I'm going to go straight into the theory in terms of the tips. I'm going to give you like four tips specifically on um, how to break this down, how to approach securing PII data and maintaining and managing that. And then I'm going to go into some practical examples and illustrations in the last piece uh, of the presentation, as well as calling out some snowflake specific stuff. So the first step after identifying where your PII data is, is to physically separate that PII data from your non PII data. So what does this mean? So it means that your data could be in one table or a group of tables, but you could split that between two different schemas, for example, so they're physically separated. This allows you to easily pinpoint all the PII data you hold in your data warehouse, and then you can target specific controls and security policies around that data. So imagine all of the issues you could run into if you needed to remove values from certain columns of PII data with an existing table. There's, there's that's quite high risk and there's lots of complexities around that. So by splitting the data physically separately, not only does it allow you to manage that data in isolation, it also mitigates that risk. One important point you always need to make sure, obviously, you need to use a way of joining the sensitive PI data and non-sensitive data back together again. So however you split it within your data model, whether that's between different schemas or just different tables, you need to make sure there's commonality between those tables so you can join the data and bring it back together for reporting and analytical purposes. The second tip that I follow is removing data in bulk. So when we talk about and think about the right to erase of, of a customer record, I like to add a couple of additional columns to my tables on the PII side of things, which allow records to be flagged for removal, along with a date that your organization received the request. So this allows you to batch up the removal of records and execute the process periodically within the time frame set, set out by the GDPR legislation. It's far easier to manage and cater for an operational process, which is running periodically rather than each and every time you get a request from an individual to move their data. A Snowflake specific aspect here, if you are doing this within Snowflake, you should consider your time travel settings and your PII data because this would allow you to potentially roll back to a period of time after you've deleted the record and you could almost by mistakenly bring that record back in to your database if you were to roll back the time on your warehouse after you've deleted the record. So it's really important that you take into account if you're using Snowflake, your time travel settings around that PII data. Tip three, and this is one I like personally because I like having visibility into my processes which are running. So it provides greater control and transparency into what's happening. It also supports any troubleshooting activity should anything go wrong. So what do I mean by this specifically? Well, at a physical level, I'd introduce a metadata table to support the monitoring of this process. So having a centralized table, which contains the following as a minimum is strongly advised. So what I would do is I'd have, a, I'd have a table, I'd have a unique identifier for that customer, 
obviously something that doesn't specifically expose sensitive information. The date the request was received to be removed from the database, the date it was flagged for removal in the database, and the date it was deleted. And at any point in time, then you can revert back to that table and it provides a level of traceability in order to see that your processes are running correctly. And it also helps if anything does or should go wrong in the future. Tip four is controlling access to that PII data. Now, because we've identified it and split it out and we've got visibility over the operational processes running because we've got a metadata table, which is orchestrating this, we now need to control access to that. And that's made far easier because we've separated it into separate schemas. So for this, we need to create a minimum of two access rules, one to access sensitive data and one which cannot. You can then combine data from the two schemas using a view and grant access to the query to both roles. And I'll show you an illustration of this to make it clearer uh, a little bit further down in the, in the as we go through the presentation. A couple of snowflake specific tips of this one. So within the view definition itself, you can make use of data obfuscation and the current role function to determine how data should be returned to the user executing the query. So when the user runs a uh, executes a view, you can actually work out what role that user sits within. And then based upon that, you can just have a simple case statement and logic to say, should I return this piece of information in clear text or should I have it masked? And I'll show you that as a little SQL snippet in a couple of slides time. One other thing to, to note about Snowflake in this regard is you can also make use of secure views to present prevent users from viewing the DDL. So essentially when you create a view, Instead of just having create view as part of your SQL, you can have create secure view. Simply by adding the word secure prevents users from looking at the, the DDL that makes up that view and it, it stops them from inferring where certain columns may, may be living from a sensitive PII perspective. Before I move into the illustrations and examples around this, I just want to make you aware that I'm currently planning to run a Snowflake Expert Bootcamp, which is a a 90 minute per week, eight week course to take people who have limited or next to no knowledge of Snowflake and want to understand the how you design and architect those solutions and put those in place. This is going to start in early October 2021. It's quite a unique offering where I'm going to be running these courses live and having weekly Q&A calls as well as a private group. Um, back when I started using Snowflake in 2017, I found it really challenging and really difficult to get hold of real world practical advice, such as what, what we're looking at today. There's obviously lots of um, official documentation on the Snowflake website, but that doesn't necessarily tell you how to, to cater for real world practical problems. And so this is what I would like to do in terms of my experience of using Snowflake for five years, is how can I give something back to the community? And, and what I've decided to do is kind of package up everything I've learned all through trial and error and all of the time and mistakes I've made to where I am today, where I can successfully design, architect and work on Snowflake. And, and that's going to cover all of these sections here and across the different weeks, right away through the architecture, deep dive on that, through to all of the other aspects, including advanced performance tuning and developing applications in Snowflake. If you're interested in this and there's a limited number of users for the first uh, for the first iteration that we're running in October, then email me there, adam.m at tmac.ai. You can also email me as well if you've got any specific questions around this that we don't get the chance to cover off. And if you want a copy of these slides, once we're finished, again, just get in touch on there and you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. And um, more than happy to, to help you out and give you more information about this course if you are interested. OK, guys, so moving on to the practical examples and just just to try to reiterate and bring to life how you can apply these tips in the real world. So on the left hand side here, we've got our, um, our database which contains two tables and this is a simplistic example, but it's it's simple just so I can explain it more easily. Obviously, in the real world, you'll have a, a number of tables and columns um, which will add complexity to this. But if we look on the left hand side, we've got an orders table with order ID, customer ID and order date in there. And then we've got a customer table where we've got customer ID, customer email, which we're classifying as PII data in this example, and a customer postcode. So the first thing that we do once we've identified where that PII data is, is to separate it and segregate that PII data out. And you can see the bottom right hand side, I've introduced a new table called customer underscore PII. We have separated out that PII information 
kept the customer ID with it so I can join it back to the customer table and the orders table. So that's the first step. We've segregated that particular sensitive data away from the, the main tables. And now let's say I've got a requirement to create a view that brings back the customer email, but only for those users who are allowed to see that. And I also need to get the last order date, so the most recent order date for a order a customer's made. And how I can do this, one, one easy way of implementing this, and we'll come to certain specific variations on this, which can improve this approach in a second, is I can just create a simple view Within that view, you've got the SQL snippet here on the right hand side where I'm using that current role function in Snowflake to say if that current role, the user that's querying that view isn't part of this, the role I've created to access sensitive data, then return this hashed bunch of X's. Otherwise, return the customer email and clear text as it sits within the within the database itself. And then I'm joining that customer PII table back to the orders table and taking a, a maximum of the order date. So a very simple example, but simple for a reason. So you guys can kind of understand it and make sense of how this can practically work for your environment in your situation. If we want to build on this slightly and make it a little bit more um, refined, what we can do is we can use something called in Snowflake dynamic data masking. So it's available at Enterprise Edition and above only, but the feature allows you to create a centralized policy in one place in your database and then attach that particular policy object to certain tables or view columns. So the feature is really useful in helping you control who can create and modify masking policies in the first place whilst also centralizing all the rules in just one place. So if you ever do need to change it again in the future, you don't, if we looked at this previous example, if you had views like this scattered all over the place, you'd have to find where all those views are and then go through and change it in all those places. So using a dynamic data masking approach, which I'll show you as an illustration of in a second, helps you just maintain that logic in one place and controls who can change that logic. The masking policy, used by Snowflake is applied to anywhere that column exists within your database. So it's pretty powerful in terms of how it works. So whether that particular column is getting access via view or directly using SQL or getting used in a where clause, it'll work that out and it'll manage that for you. So building on the example that we had before, we've still got the view. We're still looking at picking up the last order date for the customer. But now our case statement ends up in a SQL snippet at the top here in the middle as a masking policy. And basically the logic is very similar to what we had in the view originally, but now we've centralized it and we apply that masking policy to every time the email exists within the database. So now when I query on the right hand side, the SQL snippet here, when I query the table, I don't need to worry about having any business logic embedded. I can just do a direct select customer email, max order date from that that table or that view and the masking policy will be applied at runtime and the user will not see that if they're not if they're not part of that sensitive allowed role. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, if it's not, you can um, email me and I can send you the slides and you can have a look at that yourself and ask me any questions you may have. Now, I completed this slide deck um, a couple of weeks ago and as Snowflake's always progressing and always evolving and bringing out new features, there was a new feature what, which they brought out that I, I felt I should include here. So I've had to take some stuff quickly and added this to the end of the presentation just to give you a sense of where this fits into the whole picture. But earlier this, uh, earlier last month, July 19th, they made row access policies generally available. So this allows you to secure data using fine-grained content-based access control. So it simplifies the governance and improves the whole security posture and eliminates the need for those data silos. So essentially, you just need to apply three simple steps to use this, okay? And you might want to think about how we can use this with the approach I've just given you as well. It almost provides you a different dimension to managing your PII requirements. But essentially, you define a policy. So this is similar to the, to the masking policy I just talked you through, but this is at a row access level. So rather than masking a particular column itself within a table, it applies to individual rows depending on the logic that you give it. So you define a policy. You could optionally have it 
map and table, which I'll show you in a second, which can do the lookups for you to make it easier to maintain. And again, centralization of logic. You apply that policy to one or more tables, again, very similar to the dynamic masking policy, and then you query the data and the policies applied at runtime during execution of the query. So let's just go into a couple of examples on this, and I apologize for the screenshots, but um, like I say, the Snowflake just released it and it wasn't part of my original kind of content. So I've quickly grabbed these from uh, the Snowflake uh, website itself just to give you a sense of how this might work. So you create a raw access policy as shown in here in the in the query snippet I've got here. And here what we're looking to do is unauthorized rows are filtered for sales underscore NA and sales underscore EU rules. So you can see we've got this case statement where a sale when sales managers in the current role then when sales NA is in the current role, it returns NA. When sales is underscore EU current is in the current role, then it returns EU. So I'll show you what this returns in a second. So once you've created that policy, you apply the sales policy to the client info table. So here we're applying it on the column called region within the client info table. And then all data access after that point on that client info table is filtered according to the authorization in the row access policy. So what does this look like? So you can add a mapping table in here where we've got certain certain roles set up. So we've got a sales underscore NA role and that's mapped to the region code NA. And we've got a sales underscore EU role which is mapped to the region code EU. And then basically we can have this raw access policy here then which uses this mapping table region entitlement in its logic to understand if the current role is equal to sales underscore NA, then what region code do you return? Or if the sales role is part of EU, then we return the EU region code. So it's just a way of being able to manage at a row level access to sensitive information. So in summary then, if we just go back to the earlier part of, of what I described, we identify and separate the PII data out physically. That allows us then to remove the PII data in bulk and operationally provide support for that and monitor that. We introduce a metadata table as part of tip three to provide visibility and transparency into those operational processes, such as when did we get the data deletion request and when did we actually effectively remove that from the database itself. And then finally, then we're able to control access to PII data more easily because we've got that data completely separate. The Snowflake specific points that I mentioned earlier, if, you, if you're using a Snowflake, and I know many of your users are, um, you can use data obfuscation and the current role function together as a case statement within a, a view. You can en enhance that by creating it as a secure view so users can't reverse engineer out the DDL and infer where those columns sit within your database. You can then apply dynamic data masking, which promotes reuse and centralization of that logic in one place. And then you can evaluate row access policies, the new functionality that I just mentioned, and look at that in relation to your own specific requirements within your organization and see where that could also benefit you by enhancing this approach that I've currently provided you with here. Finally, I'll just go through these bits and then we'll use the last couple of minutes for any kind of questions that you've got as well but i've got a udemy course if you're looking to do the snow pro certification um, i'm also going to send a link out to you guys on the on the linkedin group that we've got for this chat and um, with a discount code so all you guys can take advantage of that please follow and connect with me on linkedin i'm pretty active on that so anything that i'm doing from a from the content or or helping people using snowflake i'm posting it on linkedin regularly and then i've got a a YouTube channel as well. Again, you'll find links to that on my LinkedIn page. I'd really appreciate it if you have a look at the videos on Snowflake that I'm producing. Please like and subscribe to that. You know, I want to kind of help you guys and connect as much as I can. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm midway through writing a book, Building Solutions with Snowflake. Some of the content that you've seen today will form part of the, the finished version of the book, and that's going to be available uh, early next year.